This is our third and final lesson from the book of Joel. As we've been looking at uh, a lesson from each each chapter. In no way is it meant to tell us every single thing we need to know from the book of Joel, but does help us understand at least some very basic things from the book. In Joel chapter 3, we will see how God not only punishes the wicked, but also how he shelters those who repent. And that's what we're going to find here this evening as we look at Joel chapter 3, as we've titled this lesson, When I Bring You Back, being a reference to God bringing back uh, the people, His people, following, of course, their repentance, that He would bring them back into the fold and how uh, their blessings would begin to, to, come, to come back again uh, following their repentance. We we'll begin in Joel chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, looking at uh, the judgment uh, on the nations. And we find in verses 1 through 3 of Joel uh, some wrongs that are avenged in Joel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. In verse 1, we find that God begins change by bringing His people back from captivity. The Bible says, Behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. So it begins by bringing them back from captivity. And we find in verses 2 and 3 that God will bring wrath on those who are the enemies of of Israel. In verses 2 and 3 he says, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. They have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as payment for, 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 for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. This just being illustrations of their supreme wickedness, the things that they have done to, to commit uh, grotesque sins. What we find here, though, in verse 2, what we want to put our focus on is that the Bible says in verse 2, the Lord will enter into judgment with them there on account, he says, on account of my people, my heritage, Israel. God's going to bring wrath upon the enemies of Israel. That's what it means to enter into judgment. He's going to punish them for their wickedness, for their sins, for their transgressions. And he is going to, no doubt, handle them. We find in verse 3, he says, Whom they have scattered among the nations, talking about Israel, they also have divided up my land, they have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as payment for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Again, illustrations of their supreme wickedness there. But God's going to bring judgment upon them. We find that he is going to avenge, so to speak, the wrongs that have been done against Israel. We find in verses 4 through 8 that neighboring nations will suffer slavery in a far land. In verse 4, the Bible says here, Indeed, what have you done with what have you to do with, my, with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Felicia? Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me, swiftly and speedily I will return your retaliation upon your own head. We find here in verse 4 that any attempt to retaliate against God will not only fail, but will also come back upon themselves. It is impossible to fight back against God. Think about this for a second. Let's think about some instances in the Bible of some tremendous judgments of God, and how could people have ever fought back against Him? For example, the flood. How do you fight back against the flood? Well, in Noah's day, in all reality, you couldn't, right? Because even if you build up dams, if you build up sandbags like we would today, and after a certain point, even they have their limits, right? If the water keeps on rising, there's literally nothing you can do to, to stop it unless you're just going to build walls and walls of sand. Well, what's going to happen? You're literally going to just be washed away. There's no way to overcome that. You think about Song and Gomorrah. How could you fight it back against God in such situations when fire and brimstone is raining down from heaven? Well, it's not possible. It's not possible to fight it back against God. And that's the point. We see it in Noah's time. We saw it there with the, with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We find it here in Joel's time when, they, when he says here, Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me, what could they do? The worst thing they could do is attack God's people. Well, we know God is already beginning to protect them, to bring vengeance upon their enemies, because so we know that's not going to work out too well for them. And so instead we find in verse 4, he goes on to say, he says, but if you retaliate against me, swiftly and speedily, I will return your retaliation upon your own head. Now, it's one thing when God is filled with wrath of where he's going to punish the people. But when you try to go back against him, I can't even begin to imagine how 
that would appear, or how to even describe God's wrath that is going to be turned up and might say another level, right? He says, He'll bring destruction swiftly and speedily. He says, I'll return your retaliation upon your own head, there in verse 4. We find in verses 5 through 8, we find that what they have done to Israel, uh, God will now do to them. In verse 5, he says, Because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried it, carried it into your temples, my prized possessions, also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem, you have sold to the Greeks that, they may, that you may remove them far from, their, far from their borders. Behold, I will raise them out of the, of the place which you have sold them. I will return your retaliation upon your own head, which means he's going to do to them as they have done to Israel, and do to them as they have tried to do to him, as they have taken his... Uh, as he says, there's the prized possessions there in verse 5. He goes on to say here in verse 8, I will sell your sons and your daughters into the, land, into the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the, to the uh, Sabans, to a people far off, for the Lord God has spoken. Why? Because they have done the exact same thing previously, right? He says there in verse 6, he says, Also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem you have sold to the Greeks. What does he say in verse 8? He's going to sell your sons and your daughters into, into the hand of the people of Judah. And they will sell them to the, to the Sabans. And so we find here, God's going to do it to them as they have done to His people. God's going to punish them. We continue reading here, and we find that the destruction of the heathen powers is being described in a so-called, by a so-called uh, divine decree, if you want to put it that way. In verse 9 and following, he says, Proclaim this among the nations. Divine simply means it comes from God. So this decree is coming from God. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around. Cause your mighty, cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. He goes on to say here, in verse uh, 12, Let the nations be waking and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, come, go down, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. What's going to happen? God says they're all going to go down to the valley, and He's going to judge them all, right? He's going to punish the wicked. He says in verse 13, Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. As I said, I'm telling some of the days, start the combine because it's time to start the harvest, right? And that's that we found there. That sickle, he says, put it in for the harvest is ripe. He says, come, go down for the wine press is full. The vats overflow for their wickedness is great. There is no time for delay. Judgment was going to come. We find in verse 14 through verse 16 here that God will bring swift destruction upon their head. He says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of, de- of decision. For the day the Lord is, is near in the, in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will d- diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake. Now over the years, you have probably have heard a lot of different loud noises. When we first came here, when we first we haven't been in the house very long, and we were inside, and the very first time they cleared or cleaned those stacks in the power plant, I thought we were getting bombed because it was so loud, just boom and boom. And I thought, what is going on? Well, now you don't even hear it anymore. But it was a loud, tremendous noise. We find here in verse 14, or 16 rather, a similar idea, but it's much scarier than just simply a power plant doing maintenance. He says in verse 16, the Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Now we know that Christ is described sometimes as the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? We all probably been in the zoo at different times and heard the lion roar. It doesn't matter where you're at, you can hear it, right? It's that deep, and I can't do it, but it's that deep roar, that deep sound you can hear anywhere you're at. And that's the idea we find here is that loud sound that no one can miss. He will roar from Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake. No doubt a very terrifying thing to to consider as we think about the judgment coming against them. 
But this, this coming roar, this shout, shows the intensity of God's judgment. When he brings out his wrath, it's not a quiet sound. Next we find Israel's new happiness is compared in the following verses in verse 16, the latter part of verse 16 and following. We'll begin by looking at how God is a shelter for his people. Going back to verse 16, uh, we saw where he will roar and the earth will shake. We also we continue reading there in verse 16, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So while he is scaring the wicked and roaring at them and the earth is shaking for the faithful, he says in verse 16, the Lord will be a shelter for his people. Well, where do people go when the storms get bad? When the sirens go off here, they run to their shelters, right? The school here has different shelters, storm shelters in place. They'll announce that they're open. They'll have those things unlocked. The people can come in there for safety. That's the idea we find in verse 16. The storm of judgment was coming, but God's people, they have a place of shelter. We find there in verse 16, it's the Lord. The Lord will be a shelter for His people. That means they have nothing to fear because they are His. And the strength of the children of Israel. So He is their shelter and He is their strength. He is their source of strength. We continue reading there in verse 17. The Bible says, So you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Why is God doing this? So they can know, although they already should know, right? That the Lord is, he says, I am the Lord your God. Notice he doesn't say a God. He says your God, which means he is their God. If he is your God, that means that he actually what? He possesses them, right? They are his people. He says, Dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, then Jerusalem shall be holy, and no alien shall ever pass through her again. We're not talking about some alien from outer space. He's talking about unknown foreign people, wicked people. They're not going to come through their land because God's going to protect them. He is their shelter, as we saw in verse 16. He is their place of safety. He is their source of strength. And what happens? Well, they don't need a wall because the Lord is the wall for them. The no one is coming in through their land ever again. As he says there in verse 17. His people, as we find next, will be blessed in verse 18 through verse 21. Uh, looking here, we're going to first look at verse 19. We're going to come back to verse 18 in a second. This is on purpose. Verse 19 says, The wicked are dealt with by God, right? He says, Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom a desolate wilderness. Because of violence against the people of Judah, for they have shed innocent blood in their land. So we see it first in verse 19, that God is bringing destruction upon the wicked. He's going to deal with them, he's going to punish them, and violence has come against the people of Judah. For they have, why? Because they have shed innocent blood, that is, they have done wicked, wicked things, they have killed innocent people, that's the idea there. To read shed innocent blood doesn't mean they just killed the innocent adults, it means they killed all kinds of innocent people, right? This includes, no doubt, women and children. They did evil, evil things. But yet we know it's next in verse 18 that God punished the wicked <clears throat> while forgiving and blessing the righteous. Verse 18 says, And it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine. Now he's describing their blessings and how they're overflowing. The mountains shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water, and fountains shall flow uh, from the house of the Lord, and water the, the valley of the Acacias. And so what we find there, God's blessings is literally overflowing them. God's blessings are literally overflowing. And we look there in verse uh, 20 and 21, he says, With Judah shall abide forever. Now this is following the destruction. Thank you. Following the destruction of the wicked people, there we saw in verse 19. So we find that comparison where they're destroyed in verse 19 of verse 20. God's people, he says, shall abide forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. He says, for I will acquit them of the guilt of bloodshed, whom I had not acquitted, for the Lord dwells in Zion. Now, we think about this idea of acquitted. It means literally the idea that those things are wiped off the slate, right? They are wiped off or as if they have never happened. And so as you look at verse 20, he says, For I will acquit them of the guilt of bloodshed, and we know why. 
because they have repented of their sins. He says, I will acquit them of the guilt of bloodshed whom I had not acquitted. That is, he had not acquitted them previously, but now they are acquitted. Why? For the Lord dwells in Zion, meaning he is again their God. He has been restored because of their repentance to his rightful place over them. And so for that reason, they are forgiven. That reason, Judas shall abide forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. And those who have shed, uh, he will equip, equip, equip those who have shed, uh, shed blood. Equip them of the guilt of bloodshed there in verse 21. So we find Israel's happiness is that God is, is their shelter. God is their source of strength. God is also, as we find in verse 18 and following, is their source of blessing. <clears throat> Next we want to notice some lessons uh, for us today. The first being that God always handles the wicked. Nowhere in Scripture are the wicked spared from judgment. God always deals with the wicked. Going back to verse 16, The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake. We know we saw previous to this. What does He tell them to do? Come down to the valley of judgment, basically, right? Because He's going to deal with every single one of them. When we think about the kind of people God was dealing with, they were wicked people. They had done tremendous evil. You know one thing you never see God do? He never shows fear. Because what can man do to him, right? He is the creator of all things. That's why when he talks about how he's going to pour out wrath upon them, if they try to retaliate, what's going to happen? It's just going to come back on them. You can't retaliate against God. That's what we find when he goes down to that valley of judgment, of judgment there in the valley of Jehoshaphat. There is no fear in God. There is nothing for him to fear. Thus in verse 16, what does he do? He roars at them. He, he shakes the ground with his voice because judgment is coming. But only, on that occasion, only for the wicked. The wicked are the ones who are punished with this intensity by God that is shown here in verse 16. The Lord, though, shows mercy to those who repent. We find that throughout the Bible. It doesn't mean there aren't consequences to people's actions, but there are, there is forgiveness. It's sad that we think about David of the Old Testament, we think about what? We think about all the great things he did. We think about David and Goliath. But we also think about David and Bathsheba. What's interesting is that David was forgiven of that sin that happened before so many people, before all the nations, right? That he was forgiven and he continued to move forward as a amazing servant for God. You know, when that event with Bathsheba happened, that wasn't his ending. You might say that was maybe halfway through his life. I'm not sure what age he was when that happened. But he still, did, he still continued to do tremendous things. Today that would be like us seeing someone, he had, he had an affair with someone, repented of it, was forgiven of it by God because that's what happens when you truly repent, right? And then continued to what? To be an amazing servant for God. It is possible. Yet today we have some people act like that's not, but that's not the case. If David can do it, anyone can do it. If, the, if Saul, who had done so much evil, can come to the, to the knowledge of the truth and obey the gospel and, get, and then become an amazing servant, then anyone can do it. The Lord shows mercy to those who repent. The Lord says He will equip or cleanse them of their, of their sin, that is, of their guilt, of their bloodshed. We also know that He does this because He wants them to know that there is, that He is their God. He says the Lord dwells in Zion, that is, He dwells with them. He is their God. <clears throat> How do we today avoid the wrath of of God. Well, think about during Joel's time, how did they avoid the wrath of God? They repented. They repented of their sins. That's why they could claim God as their shelter. That's why they could claim God as their source of blessing and their source of strength, their source of hope. They don't have to say that He's their source of hope. We understand by their actions they recognize He is their source of hope, right? When God calls all them down to, to the valley of Jehoshaphat for judgment, 
and they go to God because He is their shelter, he, they also recognize that He is their only hope. You go to a shelter in the hopes that you will be spared from danger and from harm. Well, God was their shelter. He was their hope. He was their harbor, if you will, of safety. So how does a Christian avoid the wrath of God the same way Israel did? By repentance. Judgment Day is coming, and we can avoid punishment by humbling ourselves and repenting of our sins before God. And also, we can do this, we must do it before the judgment day. If Christ returns and we have not made ourselves right with God, then we're already too late. You know, right now, we're in the midst of March Madness, you know, basketball, and I watch a little bit here and there. But what happens when someone takes the last second shot and those red lights around the goal are already on? If the ball is still in their hand and those lights are on, you know what that means? That shot, make it or miss it, doesn't count. When the Lord descends, and we try to throw up one last effort to repent, the lights are already on. We must make sure that we are right with God before that time comes. Judgment Day is coming, but we can avoid the punishment of eternal damnation by humbling ourselves, repenting of our sins, and thereby making ourselves right with God. As you look at the book of Joel in those three chapters, we find that God loves His people. There's no doubt about it. He protects them. He punishes them when they need it. He corrects them. That's part of punishment, right? And we also know that He brings them back. You remember how Joel chapter 3 verse 1 started? He says, For behold, in those days and at that time when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, when I bring them back to a place that he's going to show tremendous blessings to them because of their repentance. Do you remember the last verse in Joel chapter 2? And these won't be on the screen, but the last verse in Joel chapter 2, you remember what that says? It shall come to pass that whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Talking about what? For these individuals, we're not talking about calling on God to, in order to obtain salvation. But in reality, in their situation, it's calling upon God out of repentance. They want to be saved and not be destroyed like all those wicked people. Because in Joel chapter 3, that's what's going to happen. God was calling them all down to them all down to the valley of judgment. He's going to deal with them all. But those who had called upon God in repentance and made themselves right, those who had once obeyed God, well now they're going to be spared. We recognize, however, that only the you know for us today, the Christian who calls upon the Lord can call upon God for repentance, but we cannot call upon him for salvation, because we know there's much more in salvation than just calling upon the Lord, right? But these individuals in Joel chapter 2, what happens? They're told to call upon God. He says, Whoever calls the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. As the Lord has said among the remnant whom the Lord calls, what is He calling them to do? He's calling them to repent. And in chapter 3 we have a, the conclusion there where God's bringing wrath upon them. And those who had repented could, tell, could look at God and say, He is our shelter and He is our source of blessing. With those things in mind, we think about our own lives. We too can be restored to a right relationship with God if we will humble ourselves before Him. We find examples of that throughout the book of Joel of individuals who were called upon by God to repent of their wickedness. How the, the wicked were warned of the coming punishment and how those who called upon God in repentance will be spared while the wicked would not go unpunished. Remember, as we think about our own lives, we would do well to remember why did God call them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat? Because it was time for wrath and for judgment to take place. This evening, as we think about these things, if we too need to repent of our sins and make ourselves right with God, we have a chance to do so, not just now, but each and every day, as long as we are here, as long as we are present before, before the Lord returns.
We have time to make ourselves right, but we don't want to wait until it's too late. So let's take the advice we find from those in the book of Joel and repent and make ourselves right before the Lord returns. This evening, we can help you or encourage you in any way. You can come forward now. Let's get every stand and sing the song that's been selected. Have a way, Lord.